Getting our health back can be difficult. The culture encourages quick fixes and doesn't really seek to get to the cause of a lot of problems, sort of band-aid approaches or just kind of medicating over the symptoms as if turning up the radio is going to solve the clunking, rattling problem underneath the car hood. And we really don't seek to find meaning throughout life's challenges. They say, just, just be happy. Do whatever makes you happy, which actually encourages more unhappiness because our brains can only make a finite amount of hormones to keep us in that happy state before we start to come down. And if that doesn't work, they say now just claim victimhood. And that's a bad strategy as well. Third, the third reason it's difficult to get our health back is we have our own mistakes and our own bad programming oftentimes to overcome. Now, if I ask Siri, Siri, who is Jim Petrick when I was 17, which I couldn't because it wasn't around, it would bring up a picture of this guy on the left, Jim Petrick co-founder of the band Survivor and co-writer of one of the coolest songs of all time, Eye of the Tiger. Now, that's a cool song, but I used to really, really think it was cool. And in fact, when we'd go up to the farm in Morris, where my mom grew up, my uncles were there and they were bodybuilders, identical twins, Uncle Eric and Uncle Aaron, football players, wrestlers, the Morris Tigers, Eye of the Tiger, the whole bit. And I always wanted to listen to that record. And I would insist on playing the record and exercising with them and running out to the mailbox. It was exactly a mile from the front door out to the mailbox down this gravel road. But I just loved exercising with my twin uncles, and I insisted on having this record played all the time with Eye of the Tiger. Now, they eventually gave me that record, probably because they were sick of me asking for it, or because they finally got the soundtrack the tape to Rocky IV, which, of course, did include Eye of the Tiger. Now, I think what happens many times as we get older is we realized that we didn't become that professional athlete, we didn't become the professional singer, we didn't become a police officer, a firefighter, or the action hero of our choice. We realized that Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny weren't real, and we tend to kind of tie this big bow around that whole childhood curiosity or these dreams or these desires from our childhood. We kind of put them over there and we say, I was just a kid, I didn't really know what I wanted, I didn't really even know what to believe in, and those were kid sort of things, and I'm not interested in those things anymore. And that can be true in many ways, but just for a couple of moments, indulge me and consider a couple of lines from this famous song, Don't Lose Your Grip on the Dreams of the Past. Now, the first patient I ever had in private practice was February 7th, 2005, and his name was Frederick. He was a Marine from the air station of the Marine Corps right across the street from where I was on Miramar Road in San Diego. And he came in with lower back pain, but that's not really what brought him in. The reason he came hobbling basically across the street was because his troop was about to deploy and he couldn't pass his physical. He didn't want to go the medical, the military medical route, which I believe is still Medicaid, Medicaid, needle injection, then MRI, then possible medical leave, or at worst, discharge. He didn't want any of that, so he decided to go outside of the military, medical, managed care world and pay cash just like everybody else. Frederick was doing much better within a couple of weeks, and then he got his deployment orders. And then fast forward a year and a half later, I receive one of the coolest things I've ever received. Now, keep in mind, this is the first patient I've ever had. I've had about 4,000 or so new people that I've been fortunate to take care of since yeah. Frederick. But he comes back from Iraq, and he says, here's a flag I flew for you, and here's a copy of a poem that I wrote. And it's in our office. It's in the original frame. And in this poem, which is not a feel-good, rhymey, Dr. Seuss type of poem, he discusses what it was like to see fellow Marines get blown up, crushed, and burned alive and sniped. And he says that he was starting to begin to wonder why he was there. To save a depressed people from an oppressed country? No. He says that he was there and that he was ultimately willing to lay down his own life and kill, if need be, for his family, for his friends, for his God, and for his country. I wouldn't ask you to think about what you're willing to kill or die for, although it would clarify your values way more than a personal mission statement could. But what I want you to think about is the emotions of love and hate. Think about that. Love and hate. Childhood curiosity blended with love and hate. A powerful combination. It's the recipe for any drama movie, and it evokes strong emotion. In fact, emotion, not by accident, but by definition, emotion is necessary for motion. That's what emotion is. Thoughts, feelings, or emotion, and now prepped to take meaningful action. Think of that the next hundred or so times you're bound to hear that Eye of the Tiger song over the next several years. Now my favorite part of Rocky Part 6 is when Polly, Rocky's trainer and his brother-in-law, 
says to him in a scratchy voice, you know, you got a lot of guts getting back in that ring knowing you're going to take a beating. But you'll do all right. Rocky looks down and he says, how do you know that? And he says, because of the stuff in the basement. Because of the stuff in the basement. What is in your basement? What's that place of love and hate that you are willing to suffer for? You must fight just to keep that alive because that is exactly how you regain your trajectory and have the courage to take on new challenges.